brace yourselves. I'm about to info dump on all y'all. Oh, hi guys, it's Camille. And today's video was supposed to be just like a traditional vlog. I had even filmed a completely different intro at the park using this camera, my Canon. Upon reviewing the footage from the Canon, uh, I found out that the one and only clip that I did film was rendered unusable because the lens wound up fogging up from the humidity. So you weren't really able to see anything except fog. And you know, uh, upon reviewing the footage that I had captured throughout the day yesterday, I didn't really vlog a whole lot and there was just a lot of jumping and then by the time I got back home I basically had dinner and showered and I collapsed from the exhaustion and had the best 12 hours of sleep in my lifetime. So I figure, okay, I'm sitting here now. I feel like for this type of video, especially because, you know, I'm like writing down my thoughts and everything because I know that if I don't and I don't get them contained, I'm gonna ramble. And when I ramble, you can't shut me up. So I feel like for this specific topic, where I'm gonna be explaining a lot of different things, I figured let's, let's, let's do this a little differently. So if you read the title and you saw the thumbnail, today I'm gonna be talking about the new Lightning Lane multi-pass system and also the Lightning Lane single pass system. This is supposed to replace the highly controversial Genie Plus system that Disney implemented uh, shortly after the pandemic. And that was supposed to replace the middle of the road FastPass Plus system. I'll get to that in a second. So the new multi-pass system debuted on the 24th of July, which as I'm recording, this was yesterday. By the time you guys see this, this will have been a full week ago. And I happened to not be working that day. So I figured, okay, I'm gonna go try this out and see what the fuss is about and maybe I'll make a video out of it. And I did. <laughs> so for today's video, I'm just gonna give you guys a little bit of background with the new system as well as a little bit of background with Genie Plus and FastPass Plus. I'm also gonna show you guys how the system works because I used it the day it debuted and also just show you the footage that I captured that day from using said system. So without further ado, let's go. Okay, so the image on the screen that you're looking at now was the selection page for purchasing Genie Plus. To give a very brief rundown, Genie Plus was the new and controversial skip the line system Disney implemented shortly after the pandemic. It replaced the already somewhat divisive FastPass Plus, so FastPass gave guests the ability to book three Fast Passes in advance for select attractions in all four parks so you could skip the regular standby line. And once you used up the initial three in the park, you could book more Fast Passes afterwards. It was one at a time though. It was a free service, meaning you didn't have to pay any money to use it. Fast Pass had its fair share of critics during its lifespan in the Disney parks, which I'll list some of the critiques here to the side now. But one thing everybody could agree on was this. At least it's free to use, and we don't have to pay money. So when Disney announced the new Genie Plus system, and happened to mention that guests will now have to pay if they want to use that service, people lost their minds over it. This is also not even mentioning the various differences that Genie Plus had compared to FastPass. So, I'm just gonna take a moment now and explain said differences. So, on the screen now I have listed the differences between FastPass Plus and Genie Plus. So the biggest difference between the two of them obviously is that one was a free service, the other one you have to pay extra for. Another difference is how far in advance you can make your selections for reserving your return times for rides. So with the FastPass system, you could book up to three fast passes 30 to 60 days out from your visit. And I say that because it varied depending on if you were staying on Disney property or off. With Genie Plus, you no longer have that ability to book that far out in advance. Instead, you have to purchase the service the day of, and then you're allowed to make your Lightning Lane reservation at 7 a.m. that morning. And you can only book one Lightning Lane at a time. Another difference is the time constraints that you're kind of restricted to with Genie Plus. Once you make your initial lightning lane at 7 a.m., you cannot book another lightning lane until two hours after park opening or once you've used up that lightning lane, whichever comes first. Genie Plus also introduced the concept of individual lightning lanes in which these are the most popular attractions in all four parks that require you to pay an additional fee if you want to skip those lines. 
So of those attractions, I'll list them on the screen here. It's usually one to two rides per park. So I took the screenshot on the afternoon of July 23rd, which was the day before the new service rolled out. So these were the prices that Genie Plus were offering for that specific day. Prices with Genie Plus fluctuated throughout the year. Peak seasons like summertime, Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's, those are all going to be really expensive. In fact, uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving and spring break tend to be even worse than this. Whereas other parts of the year like August, September, February, January, sometimes a good chunk of May, those are going to be cheaper than this. So with all that background out of the way, let me show you all how to use this system. For today's test trial, as you can tell by the park reservation, I went with Hollywood Studios, a park I've avoided since Star Wars Day. So here I've clicked onto the Lightning Lane page. This is just the page that shows off all the information about Lightning Lane. So like Genie Plus, your ride photos are included with your purchase, so that's pretty cool, along with the weird Disney Photo Pass lenses. They're like Snapchat filters. Uh, they also explain how the price will vary by date and theme park. They also explain how the Lightning Lane Single Pass works, which is just the individual Lightning Lanes, and how those prices will vary by date and attraction. They'll also show you how you can find the list of eligible attractions for Lightning Lane. As you can see here, I'm just briefly reading over how to purchase a Lightning Lane Pass, but I'm not really paying attention as I'm reading it either, because I'm just trying to figure out how do I purchase them from this page. And that's when I realize I have to back out so I can hit the button that says purchase. Feel free to pause here if you want to take a look at any of this. Also what's important to note here too is that guests staying on property can book their lightning lanes seven days before their resort stay. Everybody else has to wait three days until. So at this point I go ahead and I press the purchase button. I wait for the screen to load. I go ahead and select my date, and here are all of the parks. So here, I'm just showcasing the prices. So Hollywood Studios is still 26 for that day. Magic Kingdom is 29 bucks for that day. Epcot is about $21 for that day. And then I hit Hollywood Studios again, because that's the part that I want. And then Animal Kingdom is the cheapest at 18. So what's neat is that you can purchase your multi-pass and the single pass at the same time which is pretty cool. You weren't able to do that with Genie Plus. These are the eligible multi-pass experiences for Hollywood Studios. So all the rides, one meet and greet, and a handful of shows all qualify for the multi-pass selection. The meet and greets, I will say, do not count for the pre-booking. So I select my park. I go to select my people, which would be me. But as you can tell on the screen, it's saying it's too soon. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, hmm, what's going on? So as you can tell here, I'm reading, trying to figure out what's going on. As you can tell by the clock on the screen, it's 1245 at night. So with Genie Plus, you could purchase the service at midnight, the day of your arrival. That was a neat little hack that I figured out for myself. And so I thought that same logic applied to this. So it wasn't until I had to click when to purchase on here and figure out what's going on that I finally found out, oh, I have to wait until 7 a.m. to purchase. So yeah, that does kind of stink, but it's, you know, it's whatever. It's fine. It's a learning curve. So I set my alarm for 6.55 that morning. As you can see in the recording, it's 6.59 in the morning. I head back onto the app and I patiently await seven o'clock so I can make my lightning lane purchases. So very important thing to note, Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and Hollywood Studio, all three will be using a tiered system when it comes to making your selections. You can choose one attraction from tier one and then two or all three of your selections from tier two. These vary from park to park. Animal Kingdom is the only one that will not be using the tiered system because it doesn't have enough attractions to even warrant it. So just something to keep in mind. I knew about this going into it and I already had an idea of what selections I was gonna make because I only ride four things in Hollywood Studios. So at 7 a.m. I select Hollywood Studios multi-pass purchase and I gaze at the price for Rise of the Resistance, which I chose to purchase despite how high it was. I come to regret this later, you'll see why later on in the video. So after I've made my selections, 
I am automatically selected because it's my account, but I'm also the only one going, so I don't have to choose any more people. I continue to stare at the audacity of the high pricing for Rise of the Resistance, like, good grief, am I, okay, I guess I'm doing this, whatever, I'm half awake and I am barely coherent, so here we go, it's fine. Uh, I scrolled down to hit continue, even though I didn't necessarily need to. Of the tier 1 attractions, you can choose Mickey and Minnie, Smuggler's Run, Rock and Roller Coaster, or Slinky Dog. I go with the obvious choice and select Mickey and Minnie's because I don't ride either of the other three. From tier 2, I select Midway Mania, and I also select Alien Swirling Saucers. I personally don't believe you need Lightning Lane for the stage shows, the arenas are pretty big as is, and Star Tours I never see have a long wait. Now here's the juicy part. So, all of your times are automatically selected from this point forward, but you can choose to modify all of them, which is huge. You were never able to do that with Genie Plus, only with the individual lightning lanes. So, I instantly got on it. I chose an early morning arrival window for Mickey and Minnie's. I then go over to Rise of the Resistance and I choose an even earlier time for that. I've never been able to get an earlier time for that attraction, so that was really cool. Um, so here I am, I'm just finagling with the times and just kind of figuring out in my head what the game plan is going to be since I already have a mental image of the park's layout in my brain. I'm just kind of figuring it out as I go, albeit I'm half awake at this point, so... So yeah, you do have the option to modify your arrival times for all of your pre-selections. As you can see at the top of the screen, your selections are saved for a maximum of 5 minutes. I have 4 minutes left, as you can see here. I decide not to change Midway Mania's arrival time because uh, it was going to be much later in the day and I didn't want to stay that late, so I kept it for 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So, once you've made your selections, you've customized your times, it's now time to pay for it. I'm not going to show you that part because I don't need to be showing my credit card information. So, after taxes, the grand total for the service for that day was fifty-four thirty-two, as you can see on the receipt below. And we for a single person it is a lot but I also know too that I'm going during peak season so that still doesn't make it any easier <laughs> but here are my lightning lane selections and that is some beautiful stacking if I do say so myself so by this point I am super excited and I'm like you know I'm not gonna go back to bed so I can sleep and I'm too excited to go back to sleep at this point so Overall, the process, to me anyway, was pretty painless. If any of this seemed at all familiar to you, this is because the multi-pass is almost identical to the old FastPass Plus system. So for me, there was a lot of familiarity. I loved you were able to modify your times for all four selections. That's a huge advantage. Now that you saw me book my lightning lanes, now it's time to see it all in action. So, first ride of the day is Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. This is located inside the big Chinese theater. That's right in the dead center of the park. Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway is a trackless dark ride that takes you into the zany world of the newer Mickey Mouse cartoons, as you can see on that poster up there. This ride is so much fun. There's so many different fun effects and elements to it. It's really, really cute, but it's very, very loud, especially the pre-show. So. I always recommend wearing noise-canceling headsets or earplugs if you are considered narrow spicy like me. That's just to give you a little taste of how loud the attraction is. This is one of my favorites, but I always wear earplugs just so I'm more comfortable. Anywho, had a lot of fun. This is a great ride for families, those who are scared of big scary thrill rides such as myself. As far as the Lightning Lane experience goes, since that's what this video is about, um, so for all of your attractions that do offer the Lightning Lane option, you have to scan your park ticket, your magic band, or your annual pass at the checkpoint at the entrance to each attraction that you have a Lightning Lane reservation for. Some rides happen to have more than one checkpoint. Mickey and Minnie's only has one checkpoint. Most of the attractions only have one checkpoint, but not all. Some of them have to be fun and special and they have multiple checkpoints. And now for a brief moment, my favorite gag of the entire ride. <laughs> And 
And as I was anticipating with a skip the line system, my wait time was not very long. I was ushered immediately into the main holding area before you're taken into the pre-show theater, and the line for the actual loading station was moving very, very quickly. So yeah, first lightning lane was a success. Hooray! Alrighty, we left Nikki and Minnie's Runaway Railway, had a blast, and now we're making our way into Toy Story Land. Because for one, our next lightning lane is going to be at like 1040. Also, I have not had breakfast and I've been up since like 6 something this morning. So we're going to stop by Woody's Lunchbox, see if we can grab something before we go on the ride. Alright, so I placed a mobile order for Woody's Lunchbox, but the arrival window is not until a little after 11. So, with that in mind, we're headed to Alien Swirling Saucers. If you're somebody who can't do the teacups because you don't like spinning, this is the perfect alternative. This sucker just whips you around and it's fun. So Alien Swirling Saucers is one of the few attractions in the entire resort that does require you to scan into your lightning lane twice. It has a checkpoint at the entrance and then a checkpoint halfway through the lightning lane line. Uh, much like with Mickey and Minnie's, uh, the Lightning Lane side did not have much of a wait at all. I think I only waited like maybe five minutes. And that was just waiting for the round of guests going on the saucers before my group. But yeah, that was another ride down in record time. <laughs> so I walk into the bathroom and like five minutes later I come out. It's raining. I don't know if you can tell, but it's raining. And honestly, it feels so nice. So. It's time for our arrival window for Woody's lunchbox, so we're gonna grab some food, uh, find some place a little dry so the food does not get soggy. I will come back. So for lunch at Woody's lunchbox, I had the tachos. As you can see here, these are massive and they're also insanely delicious. And while I was finishing lunch, I decided to take a look on the app to see what lightning lanes were available. So as you can see here, as I'm very quickly scrolling by not thinking, uh, Indiana Jones show lightning lanes were gone. Um, as I'm scrolling through here again, um, Rock and Roller Coaster is completely gone. So is Slinky Dog Dash. And once I get down to the very bottom here, if you give me just a couple seconds, Tower of Terror is also gone too. And now I'm gonna scroll back up slower so you can see not just the available lightning lanes, which most of them were for later in the day, but also the insanely long standby wait times. And also too, it turns out I was mistaken, none of the meet and greets in the park offer lightning lane, which was odd because I know that the Olaf meet and greet and the uh, Mickey and Minnie Red Carpet Dreams meet and greet, they were both options with the old Genie Plus system. So I wonder if that's going to be the case with all the parks that none of the meet and greets will be available for Lightning Lanes. And I am aware again, it is the middle of summer, so I do kind of anticipate some of these wait times to be long, but, but yeah, this is what the tip board looked like at 1120 that day. Okay, we've had lunch. It's cooled down a tiny bit thanks to the rain, though it's probably gonna get more humid before the next bit of rain comes. So our lightning lane for Rise of the Resistance is not until like 11.55 and we still have a lot of time until we get to that point. So we're gonna get some AC and we're gonna go see Muppet Vision. And the quickest way to get there is to go through Galaxy's Edge and then come out the other entrance. So this is the first time I've been over in Galaxy's Edge area since Star Wars Day and it is significantly less crowded than it was when I was here last, I can tell you that right now. I'll flash footage from my last vlog here. Compared to now, well this is like nothing. Sweet. So this is Muppet Vision 3D. It is a 3D movie attraction, very similar to Mickey's Philhar Magic over at the Magic Kingdom. It is primarily just a 3D film with some fun special effects around the actual theater. And it's Muppet themed. It's really, really funny. It's a very old attraction. I think it opened with the park. And you can do Lightning Lane, but it's never needed. 
So like I mentioned a second earlier, uh, you can use Lightning Lane for this attraction, but it's really not that necessary. It just basically takes you through a different path to get to the same waiting area they hold everybody in. Like I also mentioned in the Star Wars vlog, you're not allowed to film the Muppet Vision 3D show. My guess otherwise it would interfere with the special effects, but it is a really cute show, and it's a great way to get 20 minutes of pure AC, which was what was needed here. Oh hi, I'm back. So that was a much needed AC break. I cannot stress enough, if you choose to go to the parks like during the summer months, like between the months of like end of May all the way to like September, uh, when it's especially in August when it's like super duper humid, I cannot recommend enough. Please, please take plenty of AC breaks. Your body and your brain will thank you for it. It's now time for the Lightning Lane for Rise of the Resistance. Rise of the Resistance is what's now considered an individual lightning lane, or with the new system, a single pass attraction, which you have to pay a separate fee for to gain access to if you want to skip the line. Rise of the Resistance was also extremely expensive, so it was like 25 bucks, as you saw earlier in the video. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna make our way over there now. So I was just about to hop into lightning lane when I saw they're offering single rider lines. That's so weird. They've never offered it for this ride before. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I later came to regret purchasing that $25 Lightning Lane because I could have taken the single rider line and it probably would have gotten me on there just as quick because Lightning Lane for this attraction, it has never failed me even when it was still considered Genie Plus. The line goes by super duper fast and you are in the action right away. Words cannot express just how incredible this attraction is. It really truly is an experience. It blows my mind every time I ride the ride. So highly recommend it if you're ever in Walt Disney World. I do recommend getting the Lightning Lane if you really truly want to skip the line because the attraction I feel like is worth the price tag. But if you don't mind having your group split up, definitely get the single rider because you'll get on there just as fast and it's free. Did you find what you were looking for, sir? Double the patrols. Interrogate the merchants. Detain travelers. Oh. I want information. Do not fail, Lieutenant. Are we clear? Yes, sir. We are clear, sir. Okay, that was fun. So we're now making our way back into Toy Story Land because we have one more lightning lane that's coming up in just a couple minutes. We're now headed to Midway Mania. So that's the entrance to the ride over there, but right next to it, you can meet Woody and Jesse. There's a pretty big line to see them and it's not the ones. We're not gonna say hello to them today, so let's make our way over to Midway Mania. Alrighty, I don't know how well I'm gonna shoot while filming. But we shall attempt, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Parker. Welcome to the practice game. So this ride had by far the longest wait time in the Lightning Lane line. I was in that line for 30 minutes. And the standby, even though it said it was 85 minutes, was practically empty. So I was really confused, but you know, I still made it on the ride. I was just shocked how long the wait was. So after I got off the ride, as you can see here in this footage, it's 1.37 in the afternoon, I looked to see what other lightning lanes I could obtain in the other parks. So I'm scrolling through here on screen now, what was available for Epcot at that time. Forgive me for scrolling through really quick because I low-key forgot I was recording the phone. So even though the standby waits at Epcot aren't too terribly bad, a lot of the lightning lanes were already gone. So like Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, Frozen Ever After, Guardians, even Spaceship Earth, and Mission Space, which aren't the most popular rides in the world, those lightning lanes were all gone. So I next check out Magic Kingdom. Now, Magic Kingdom's lightning lanes, depending on the attraction, were either already completely gone or they were not until much later in the evening. So like Big Thunder Mountain and Buzz Lightyear, as you can see on screen, were completely gone for the day. Haunted Mansion was also completely gone for the day as well, and its standby wait is like over an hour. Small World still had some, 
but not a whole lot. Jungle Cruise is completely gone. Pooh Bear was completely gone. Uh, Mickey's Philhar Magic and Monsters Inc. Laugh Floor still had very early Lightning Lane reservations, but Pirates was completely gone. Space Mountain and Seven Dwarves were completely gone. All of Tiana's was completely gone. The Speedway was gone, which was shocking. You could still get Virtual Queue for Tron, but no more Lightning Lanes. But yeah, it was a slim pickings for Magic Kingdom, that was for sure. So finally, I decided to check out Animal Kingdom. Animal Kingdom, I must reiterate, is the only park that doesn't do the tiered system. So, Flight of Passage obviously was all taken up. Dinosaur was broke down, but you could still get a lightning lane for it. Uh, Navi River Journey was also completely gone, and so was Cali River Rapids. But the rest of the park was still relatively available, and even Kilimanjaro Safari had a really early return time. So that was surprising, but I didn't want to go to Animal Kingdom because it was really hot. I did briefly consider going to see the Frozen sing-along, but I was just like, no, I really don't want to waste it on a show. I want to just use it on a ride. So I decide to mosey on back over to Epcot's page to see what kind of lightning lanes I could get. Even though, let's be real here, as you could tell on screen, a good portion of the wait times for some of the smaller attractions that had lightning lanes available weren't even that long. But I was like, you know, I paid $26, let's just do something. So I decide to choose a uh, Journey into Imagination with Figment. Keep in mind, it's also for $4.20. That was the earliest time I could get. And I was like, okay, I'm all good. I made my lightning lane. Yippee. Hooray. Woohoo. So I go back to my tip board and I'm greeted with this little section right here, this window right here that says check for another experience now. So this is when I start to think to myself, am I actually able to book another ride right now? Because with Genie, you had restrictions when it came to stacking and some parks were harder than others and wouldn't you look at that? I'm able to book Living with the Land too, And it's for immediately after Journey into Imagination's Lightning Lane. What this proved to me is that this system has the massive potential to be a stacking machine, if done correctly, and depending the park. I would have to test it out more for myself, but hey, now I know, and now you know. After I recorded the footage off of the app, I made my way to the front of the park, decided to take a look at the Haunted Mansion merchandise, saw Jiminy Cricket out by the park entrance, and decided to say hello to him since he's a rare character, and I decided to go back to my house for about an hour, an hour and a half, and then I would make my way back over to Epcot and traverse in the heat once more so I could fulfill my final two Lightning Lane selections for the day. So it's a little after four, I'm back in my car, and you guys, it's gotten worse. <laughs> now I don't know if you can tell, but it's starting to pour, and I couldn't be happier. Although, it's, it is getting a wee bit wet out here, and I have absolutely no coverage whatsoever, so we're going to try and find some cover, uh, hopefully make our way over to Journey to Imagination, which is the first lightning lane. For this park anyway. So the Figment Ride is another attraction at Disney World that has two check-in points for your Lightning Lane, one in the main entrance and the other halfway through the line. Uh, this was basically a walk-on. Even the standby side had virtually nobody there, so ideally I probably didn't need a Lightning Lane for this attraction, and I mean most days that's normally the case. But this did reflect a problem that I did see early on in the days that most of the popular and bigger attractions, all of their Lightning Lanes were completely depleted by the time it was either mid-morning or mid-afternoon. They, they sold out very, very quickly, and so you weren't left with a whole lot of options. Again, that's one of the reasons why I even chose a Lightning Lane 4 figment, because by midday, there really wasn't a whole lot of options left to choose from. Our final ride is here in the Land Pavilion, and it's considered one of the best rides in the park. That's right, living with the land. It was also the only ride that I had ridden that day where I did not feel the need to wear earplugs because it is a quieter attraction, at least to me. 
So as you could tell from the last bit of footage, there there wasn't a very big line, even though the wait time said it was 15 minutes, it wasn't. There wasn't a whole lot of people in standby. So again, there was no need for the lightning lane, but the lightning lane does cut off a lot of the back and forth and the switchback layout that the standby line has, especially when it is actually busy in the park. But for the day that I went, it wasn't necessary. So the footage that I have here of Living With The Land was the last of the footage that I had filmed for the day. And after I got off the ride, I decided it was too hot, it was too humid, I need to go home, I'm tired, I'm done with people for the evening. So, that was my day using the new multi-pass system. So, what did I think? For me, I thought the mechanics at first glance were very easy to get the hang of. This operates very much like the old FastPass Plus service, albeit with a few small tweaks with the biggest tweak being now you have to pay for it. I love that you can alter the times for your pre-selected lightning lanes, as I feel like this does give you the best possible chance to lay out your game plan for the day, so to speak. I also like that now you can purchase the multi-pass and the individual lightning lane attractions in one transaction. That's super convenient. And from what I've been seeing since the recording of this, people have been able to buy both Seven Dwarves and Tron at the same time. So for Magic Kingdom, some people can have as many as five lightning lanes stacked up at once prior to your park visit. That's insane. While I didn't figure this out until it was much too late into the day, you can stack lightning lanes with this new system. I feel like for the person who likes to plan things out, and for the person who wants to make their park day as efficient as possible, this is a game changer. I feel like had I decided to park hop early, or if I would have tried this in a different park, say Magic Kingdom, I probably could have gotten on more attractions utilizing the service to its fullest potential. For the day that I tested this out, I managed to get four lightning lanes for Hollywood Studios, did one attraction without a lightning lane, and two attractions at Epcot with lightning lane. Not bad, all things considering, not bad. Personally, just from the little bit that I used it, I really liked it. Obviously, it's gonna be a learning curve for everyone, but I am willing to learn the system. So do I recommend the new service? Honestly, I think it kind of depends on a lot of different factors, like if you're on vacation, if you're a local, how many people are in your group for vacation, are you traveling solo on your vacation, what kind of priorities do you and or your group have in mind, how much do you all want to get done? What time of year are you going? So on and so forth. There, there's a lot of different things that go into these decisions. Like for me personally, for example, I don't see myself using multi-pass very often. In fact, I feel like that's going to be like on a rare occasion. Because I'm a local, and I can visit the park as often as I'm able to, I would prefer to just save the money because, again, I can come whenever I'm able to so I don't have that same kind of urgency to get everything done like somebody on vacation would. Now, let's say if I had family visiting from out of state and they don't get to go to the parks as often as I do, then yes, I would absolutely recommend using Multipass to its fullest extent if you want to be able to get as much as you can done because your family doesn't get to go to the parks as often as you do. And I feel like that same logic would apply for those going on vacation if this is something that they really would like to prioritize, getting as much stuff done as humanly possible. I feel like if you're somebody who likes to plan, like me, and you like to have an idea of when and where you're going to be, and if you're able to quickly lay out the groundwork and the game plan for the pre-selections and for any future Lightning Lane bookings after the initial ones that you've made prior to your vacation, then I think this system might be worth looking into. If you're someone who gets overwhelmed with planning, or you would just much rather prefer to wing it and would like to save the money because, let's be real here, Disney is not cheap whatsoever, then I think you might be able to do fine without Lightning Lane. If you're able to utilize single rider lines and you're able to prioritize specific attractions during rope drop and utilize virtual queues where you can, I think you'll be able to accomplish just as much without it. Again, it just depends on you and your situation. There are some criticisms that I have with the new multi-pass system. I think my biggest one is the tiered system that they use for Epcot, Hollywood Studios, and Magic Kingdom. 
I didn't like it when they did it with Fast Pass Plus, and I don't like it with the uh, multi-pass service. <laughs> Especially for parks like Hollywood Studios and Epcot, it really does limit your choices. And it does make your group have to sit down and think, okay, which ones are we willing to miss out on potentially because the waits will be too long and there's a good chance we probably won't get lightning lanes for these other ones because they're so popular. This is mainly in Epcot's case. Hollywood Studios, because again, I only ride four things there, it doesn't bother me as much because from tier one, I only ride Mickey and Minis, so there's that. But I know a lot of people love Slinky Dog, and love Mickey and Minis, and Smuggler's Run. And there's a few crazy people out there that like Rock and Roller Coaster. So, you know, it does make the decision making that much more difficult for people. Another common criticism that I've been seeing since Multipass debuted is the fact that Lightning Lanes sell out much faster than they did with Genie. I did notice this the day that I tried this out on several attractions like Buzz Lightyear, Haunted Mansion, uh, the Speedway and Tomorrowland, which is virtually unheard of. Even Spaceship Earth had nothing left. So I could see where people were coming from. This footage that I'm showing you right now was me trying to look at what Lightning Lanes were available three days from the recording date and as you can see, uh, some options were available still, but a lot of them were much, much later in the evening. So while I think this might be just a fluke because, you know, the system's still relatively new, I do have a feeling that it could be because resort guests can make their reservation seven days out from their trip, whereas people who are staying off property and local annual pass holders are stuck waiting until three days before. And by the time you get to three days before, a good portion of the good ones are gone. And even the lesser ones, you can't even get until much later in the day, some of them. So I feel like there's going to be that problem. That issue existed with the FastPass Plus system too. So only time will tell, I suppose. So overall, I really like the new service. Does it have its flaws? Absolutely. Some of the flaws it does share with the old FastPass Plus system. Obviously the fact that this is a service that you have to pay for and because the price fluctuates There is a chance you're either gonna be paying way more or maybe a little less Which honestly I think people would like to go with the latter rather than the former But you know it still does work as intended There is great potential with stacking lightning lanes with this system I do like that for the pre-selections you can modify the times, and I do feel like that this is a service that is easier to get the hang of uh, mechanics-wise, so to speak. I feel like even those who aren't as tech-savvy as other people will be able to get the hang of this. So overall, yeah, I really liked it. I got several attractions in that day, which, you know, and they all were pretty consistent and like one right after the other, which I like. And you know, I had a good day. It was very hot, but you know, I had a good day. Um, definitely served its purpose. I didn't have to really wait for anything with the exception of Midway Mania. I mean, I wish it wasn't as expensive as it was, but you know, that is what happens when you decide to test this in July because that's when they decide to debut it. So thank you guys for watching. I do apologize this is a longer video and I do apologize that this video is very weird in terms of layout and format, especially compared to the other vlogs that I've done thus far. I know it's a little weird and it's a little jarring, but I do hope that this video was informative to some of you. I hope that this was entertaining for some, and I hope that this gives some clarity to the new multi-pass system. I would like to know, what do you guys think of the new multi-pass service? Do you think it's worth it? Have you tried it out yourselves? If you have, please feel free to leave your thoughts down in the comments. I do read every comment that I get, and I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this, because I know that everybody has their own opinion, and I love to hear everybody's opinion on these things, so... Thank you again for watching, it really does mean so much to me. Be sure to tell your friends and family about the channel, and if you guys have any questions about any of my videos at all, be sure to leave them down in the comments, I do always read them. I'll see you soon.